This is Matt Dean with A Plus College Ready, and this is our third AP Biology exam review video. In this video, we're going to concentrate on the central dogma of genetics. We're also going to talk a little bit about regulation, and then just a couple of other fine points. First of all, though, we want to start with the central dogma. I want you to realize that DNA's job in your body is to code for proteins. That's what DNA does. Proteins then go on to determine essentially everything about you. Proteins make up your muscles, your skin. Maybe most importantly, they make up your enzymes, which help your chemical reactions to take place. So we know that DNA is copied during a process called replication. This happens during the S phase of interphase, just before a cell is getting ready to, to split, either through mitosis to clone itself and make new cells and maybe grow or repair or replace, or maybe through meiosis in which the cell is going to uh, split in a way that halves its number of chromosomes and it's going to end up making our sex cells or our gametes. All right, when, when a gene is ready to be expressed, the first thing that happens is that the DNA will split and one of those strands is going to be used as a template. And the process of transcription is going to happen to that strand. That strand is going to uh, act as a template for an enzyme called RNA polymerase, which will transcribe it into a molecule known as messenger or mRNA. That single-stranded molecule will then, at least in eukaryotes, next be processed. And we'll talk more about RNA processing in a minute. In bacteria, there's very little processing that takes place. Once the RNA is processed, um, it will go out to the ribosomes, which are essentially structures out in the cytoplasm or maybe attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum, which will use the directions in that messenger RNA to make proteins. After the proteins are put together, at least the amino acid sequences are put together, the protein then undergoes what's called post-translation modification. And in that process, the protein is folded into its proper structure and that structure will then go on to determine the protein's function. So here we see transcription happening. So this is the DNA template strand. It's always going to run from um, three prime to five prime direction. RNA polymerase is going to build RNA from five to three prime. Notice one strand is going to be built. Uh, when when the and it's doing this not only one strand at a time but essentially one gene at a time. So as in replication, both strands are copied. All the DNA is copied. In transcription, we're talking about transcribing certain genes or groups of genes one at a time. Transcription essentially happens in three basic stages. So we have initiation. And that's when uh, the RNA polymerase binds to a promoter. Sometimes we might hear that called the Tata box. Um, the DNA is unwound and we get what's called elongation in which the uh, RNA strand, the mRNA strand is built. Nucleotides are attached together, building that mRNA strand. Eventually RNA polymerase is going to reach the end of the gene or the termination sequence. And in that case, uh, it's finished. So the mRNA will separate from the DNA, all the associated enzymes will separate, and the DNA, the two strands, will wind back together. And that's transcription. So now we have a piece of messenger RNA, what's called the primary transcript. That primary transcript will then in eukaryotes undergo RNA processing. In prokaryotes like bacteria, it's essentially ready to be translated. But let's talk about RNA processing in eukaryotes for a minute. First of all, we get what's called front end or five prime modification. And this is when a protective cap is put on to the five prime end. Uh, this cap will uh, help the piece of RNA to attach to the ribosome during translation. We also get back end modification or three prime modification of the primary transcript. And this is usually when a bunch of a nucleotides are attached to the three prime end of the, the uh, mRNA. This helps to protect it from the digestive enzymes in the cytoplasm. You can think of it almost like a um, 
a telomere for a chromosome. It's a piece that's made to be lost. And it's a way to protect the more important sequences above it in the strand. The most important part of RNA processing is what we call middle modification. Remember that we have strands of DNA called exons. Those are coding sequences. And we have other strands of nucleotides that are called introns. They're non-coding. For a long time, those were called junk sequences, and we didn't think they really did anything. What happens in RNA processing is that the introns are removed, and they're removed by special enzymes called spliceosomes. You might hear them called SNRPs. And then the exons are spliced back together. So here we see a primary transcript. The introns have been removed. The exons spliced back together. We get this mature piece of mRNA, which will then go on to be translated to make a protein. But what we found just in the last few years is that an intron isn't always an intron, and an exon isn't always an exon, and that the same piece of mRNA that was made from a specific set of DNA can be processed in different ways. So that what was an intron in one situation may be an exon in another situation. What was an exon in one situation may be an intron in another situation. So that means that the same exact mRNA can lead to a different mature mRNA after processing. And that we can end up with a completely different protein which came from the same gene. So this is an additional source of variation. This is the way that one gene can actually be processed in different ways based on different situations to give us completely different proteins. All right, so again, here we see a DNA sequence. That DNA sequence or that specific gene has been transcribed to give us what we're gonna call our primary transcript. That primary transcript of mRNA is now gonna be processed. So it gets a cap added to the five prime end. It gets a sequence of uh, adenine nucleotides, a poly A tail added to the three prime end. And in the meantime, the introns are removed and the exons are spliced together to give us a mature mRNA, which will then be um, translated and used to make protein. But the key important thing to remember is the idea of alternative processing. That what's an intron in one situation may be an exon in another situation. So that allows one gene to actually be used to code for multiple proteins. And that is a huge source of variation for us. Translation comes next. Translation happens in three stages as well. We have initiation, and this is where the mRNA leaves the nucleus and it binds to the small part of the ribosome. We have a tRNA called the initiator tRNA that comes in and binds. And then the large portion, the large subunit of the ribosome will join that. And now we'll have a unit. Next, we get chain elongation. So this is when the ribosomes read the mRNA and tRNA will bring in the appropriate amino acids and place them in the right order. The amino acids will then be bonded together with a covalent bond known as a peptide bond. Eventually, um, the ribosome makes it to the end of the mRNA, the stop codon. Uh, at that point, the, the protein or at least the polypeptide chain is complete. The mRNA disconnects from the ribosome and can be used again to make additional copies of the protein. The two pieces of the ribosome will, will separate. So here we see tRNA. Remember, tRNA's job is to deliver the appropriate amino acid to the right location at the ribosome. Each three nucleotide sequence on an mRNA is a codon. Each codon codes for a specific amino acid. Each tRNA also has a sequence known as the anticodon. And for an amino acid to be put in the right place in a protein sequence, the codon from mRNA has to be complementary to the anticodon from tRNA. If these codes aren't complementary, this particular amino acid will not be placed in that location in the protein. So it's a way to make sure that the right amino acid is put in the right place. So here we see the process of translation happening. So we have initiation, 
where the mRNA binds to the small ribosomal subunit. Remember, this uh, five prime cap helps that to happen. The large subunit attaches, and the uh, initiator tRNA will, will bind. The anticodon of UAC on the tRNA binds to the codon of AUG on the mRNA. Next, we'll start chain elongation. And in this case, a new tRNA with an anticodon of CAU will deliver its amino acid to the codon of GUA. And notice it delivered valine. And that valine got bonded to the methionine from the first tRNA, which will then leave and go and get another methionine so that it can be used later. The ribosome just continues to scoot down the mRNA. Now it's at the next codon on the mRNA, AAA. So the only tRNA that can fit in this spot is one that has an anticodon of UUU. It's bringing with it the amino acid phenylalanine, which will then get bonded to the valine. Remember, that bond is called a peptide bond. That process will continue until the ribosome gets to the stop codon. And at that point, uh, we're going to get um, separation. The mRNA will separate and maybe go be used again. And the chain of amino acids is a polypeptide chain. After all that's over, we get post-translation modification. So this is when the protein is folded. So that folding can happen uh, either in the rough ER or it can happen in a little tube called a chaperonin. So if a protein is made by a ribosome that's bound to the rough ER, the protein is going to go into the rough ER where it will get folded. It'll get put inside a vacuole and will more than likely be exported out of the cell to be used in a different place. On the other hand, if, if the protein is made by a ribosome that's freely flo floating out in the cytoplasm, it's going to get bent into shape in this little tube-like structure called the chaperonin. And once it gets bent into its proper shape and it becomes functional, those proteins, the ones that are made on free-floating ribosomes, are likely to stay inside the cell that made them, and they'll work to help it function. The, the way a protein folds is largely determined by the polarity of the amino acids within it. So if a mutation occurs and maybe you had um, a polar amino acid in a location, but after the mutation you end up with a nonpolar one, that can cause the, the protein to bend into a completely different conformation and therefore lose its function. So let's skip forward. One other thing I'll mention here is that a piece of, uh, a piece of mRNA can be used by multiple ribosomes at the same time. We call it a polyribosome. And this kind of situation might happen if there's a protein you need a lot of really fast. So we have multiple ribosomes translating that same piece of RNA at the same time. Another thing I want to talk about today are mutations. So there's several kinds of mutations that can happen. But remember, a mutation is a change in the, the nucleotide sequence of DNA. Maybe the most simple mutations are called point mutations. And they're where a single nucleotide is essentially changed to another nucleotide. Sometimes you'll hear these called substitutions. There's different ways these can happen. You can get silent point mutations. And this is when the, the new codon, after the mutation, still codes for the same amino acid that the original codon coded for. Because remember, there's a lot of um, um, excess built into the genetic code where that there are several codons that code for most of the amino acids. So if we get a mutation where the newly mut mutated codon codes for the same amino acid as the original one, it's called a silent mutation. You would never know this happened. It doesn't change anything. It would cause no ill effects. It wouldn't cause anything good to happen either. It just has no effects. Then we can also get missense point mutations. These are when the, the mutation causes that single codon to code for a different amino acid than it was originally meant to code for. If the two amino acids are similar in terms of 
polarity, it's probably not going to cause a huge, huge disaster either way, a huge effect. But if the amino acids vary in polarity, that can completely change the shape of the protein and make some, some very bad things happen. An example of a missense point mutation is uh, sickle cell anemia. It occurs when just one nucleotide is wrong. One nucleotide is substituted for the wrong one in the hemoglobin protein. We can also get nonsense point mutations. And this is when um, a codon that was supposed to code for an amino acid now is changed so that it becomes a stop codon. And this is going to affect all the rest of the amino acids in the sequence past that point because they won't be translated. So you're not going to get a functional protein. This is probably going to be a pretty serious type of mutation. So point mutations, also called substitutions, are when one nucleotide is substituted for another one. And they can be silent, they can be missense, or they can be nonsense. Now there's also another type of mutation called a reading frame shift mutation, or sometimes just frame shift. And there's two versions of those, insertions or deletions. So as an example, here's a sentence, the big tan dog ran. But let's say in this case that we accidentally put an extra O in between the B and the I uh, in big. Well, we can only read in our DNA language three-letter words, codons. So when that extra nucleotide got put in, the reading frame completely changed. And our sentence no longer says the big tan dog ran. It says the and then a bunch of nonsense. So it scoots over the groupings of threes. These, these mutations are going to cause vast changes, and they're, in most cases, going to be similar. This one is called an insertion. The same thing can happen if we simply delete a nucleotide or multiple nucleotides. Either way, the reading frame has changed, and all of the amino acids past that particular point are going to be affected. So those are our types of mutations. All right, one other thing we need to talk about as far as mutations go are germ cell mutations versus somatic cell mutations. Remember, somatic cells are just your normal body cells, whereas germ cells are the cells that undergo meiosis and eventually make either the sperm or the eggs, the gametes, the haploid gametes. So if you, as an individual, have a somatic cell mutation, that mutation is going to affect you. And it might cause something good or, or, or bad to happen in you. More likely, it's going to cause something bad. More than likely, it's going to cause the cell that had it to die. But it could lead to cancer. But the point being, that mutation is not going to be passed on to your offspring. The only mutations that are passed on to your offspring are mutations that happen in the germ cells. Because those are the cells that end up becoming the sperm or the eggs and end up passing on part of your DNA to your offspring. So germ cell mutations are the only ones that are important for future generations in terms of uh, evolution or in terms of changes in DNA over time. So here's an example free response question from uh, an AP exam from a few years back. So it says the table below shows the amino acid sequence of the carboxyl terminal segment of a conserved polypeptide from four different but related species. So this is essentially part of a protein that four related species share. Each amino acid is represented by a three letter abbreviation and the amino acid residues in the polypeptide chains are numbered from the amino end to the carboxyl end. Empty cells indicate no amino pr acid present. So part A, assuming that species one is the ancestral species. So it's the, the oldest one in terms of evolutionary time, the others evolved from it. Explain the most likely genetic change that produced the polypeptide in species two, and the most likely change that produced the polypeptide in species three. So let's first start by comparing one to two. And we see that uh, it's valine, valine, histidine, leucine, valine. Right here we have a difference. Difference between these two. But the rest are the same. So since only one, one amino acid sequence has changed, that's telling me that the mutation that caused this change to happen was a point mutation or substitution. And we could be a little bit more 
specific and say that this was a missense point mutation. One nucleotide was substituted for another one. That changed one codon, and therefore we got one different amino acid in the polypeptide sequence. Now, on the other hand, if we look at three, and we compare three to one, notice that everything's the same up until we get here. And these last two amino acids just aren't there. So the easiest way to explain that change is that in this codon, codon number nine, there was a nonsense point mutation. Remember, a nonsense point mutation is when one nucleotide is substituted for another and it changes the codon from a, from a codon that codes for an amino acid to a, to a stop codon. So at that point, things stopped and we didn't get any more amino acids. Finally, part B, predict the effects of the mutation on the structure and function of the resulting protein in species four. Well, if you look at species four and we compare four to one, everything is the same up in for the first four, for the first four amino acids. But after that, notice everything's different. More than likely what happened here is that we had a frame shift mutation. Either we got some insertions or some deletions that moved the reading frame over. It changed the order, complete order of the amino acids from the point of the mutation there on out. Now, it doesn't really ask us so much for that. What it asks us for is the effects of the mutation on the structure and function of the protein. So what I would say is that since amino acids five through 10 are all different than the original, that means that the shape of the protein is going to be completely different. And since structure determines function, the function of the protein is also going to be very different. That's probably enough to answer part B. All right, another topic that we want to mention today is gene regulation. And we want to talk about why genes need to be regulated. In a multicellular organism like a human, we know that all of your cells have exactly the same DNA. But all of the genes are not expressed in each cell. By expressing only certain genes in certain cells, our cells are able to differentiate. Skin cells are able to become skin. Muscle cells are able to become muscle. Um, cells in your stomach are able to become those types of cells. That's what we mean by cell differentiation. We call that process selective gene expression. Only certain genes are own in certain cells. Another thing we want to mention here briefly are stem cells. Stem cells are cells in which none of this differentiation has happened yet. So none of the DNA has been deactivated. Stem cells are cells that have the potential to differentiate into any kind of cell in your body because they haven't decided what they want to be when they grow up yet, essentially. So cells that are stem cells are called totipotent cells. These are cells that still have the potential to become any type of cell, cell in your body. There's been no turning off of, of genes or sets of genes yet. As embryonic development continues, the cells, some of them at least, become pluripotent. They can still have the ability to become several different kinds of cells, but not any kind of cells, because some of the DNA has been permanently deactivated. By the time you're born, most of your cells are unipotent cells. And this means that most of the DNA has been permanently deactivated in each, each of those cells, and that the only DNA that's still working is the, are the genes important for that particular kind of cell. The only genes active in a skin cell are the cells needed to, to make, make skin. The only genes working in a muscle cell are the genes needed to make muscle cells. So those are uniponent cells. So let's, let's talk first about how genes are regulated in bacteria or prokaryotes. All right, so in prokaryotes or bacteria, there are structures called operons. An operon is a set of related genes. They're called structural genes. And the other parts of the DNA which help to regulate when those genes are expressed and when they're not. So let's start off by talking about an area called the promoter. The promoter is the area where the RNA polymerase will bind. The promoter is essentially saying 
the gene starts here. Start transcription here. In between the promoter and the actual genes that we need to transcribe is an area called the operator. And the operator is an area where uh, a protein called the repressor may or may not be bound. If an active repressor is bound to the operator, transcription is blocked because the RNA polymerase can't make it from the promoter to the genes. So when there's a repressor bound to the operator, the gene is off. It's not expressed. On the other hand, when there's no repressor bound to that operator, RNA polymerase will bind at the promoter and it will proceed across over to the structural genes. It will transcribe the DNA into RNA, messenger RNA, and then that RNA will go and be translated. So in this case, the gene is on. Now, there's a, a famous operon called the LAC operon. The structural genes in the LAC operon code for the enzymes that break down the sugar lactose. So let's say that you're a bacteria. You don't have any lactose in your environment. It doesn't make sense to make lactase, the enzymes that break down lactose. So when there's no lactose present in the environment, the repressor binds to the operator and these genes stay off. But let's say that now you're a bacteria floating around in a cup of milk. So there's lactose everywhere. Lactose is a good food source. You need to be able to use it. So what ends up happening is that the lactose acts as what we call an inducer. The lactose will bind to the repressor. And like always, when something binds to a protein, it changes its shape. That repressor will then fall off of the operator. And then the uh, RNA polymerase can transcribe the genes, make the mRNA, and the mRNA will make the proteins. So the LAC operon is an inducible operator. It's usually off, but in the presence of a certain chemical or a certain environment, it can be induced. It can be turned on. All right, here's a different uh, operon in bacteria or prokaryotes. This is called the TRIP operon. These structural genes code for a set of enzymes that make help the bacteria to make uh, the amino acid tryptophan, which it has to have, but it doesn't normally get it in its environment from its food. So normally, these structural genes are expressed. So we can see that the genes are coding for mRNA. The mRNA is being translated into the enzymes, and these enzymes will make the tryptophan. But let's say the bacteria finds itself in a situation where there's lots of tryptophan in the environment. So in that case, the tryptophan in the environment will bind to a repressor that's been inactive up until this point. That will change that repressor protein shape in a way that will allow it to fit to the operator. So since it's now bound to the operator, it will block the transcription of the genes. So these genes are now off. And they'll stay off until the tryptophan in the environment is used up. Now, if that tryptophan is eventually used up, this molecule of tryptophan will also be used up. That repressor will go back to its inactive state and the genes will become active again and they'll be expressed again. So let's, let's uh, summarize. An operon is the main way that bacteria regulate their genes. An operon is a set of related genes and the other parts of the DNA nearby that help to regulate the expression of those genes. And they can come in inducible operon form, like the LAC operon, or in the form like a TRIP operon, which is called a repressible operon. The TRIP operon is usually on, but can be turned off in certain situations. So let's also talk a bit about how genes are regulated in eukaryotes. Eukaryotes typically don't have operons. We can regulate our genes on several different levels, but in most cases, it's about, the tr about transcription. Most of the regulation that happens in eukaryotes is about regulating whether transcription happens or not. One way that can happen is through gene regulatory proteins. The steroid hormones uh, like testosterone and estrogen, for example. Remember, they're steroids, so they can go straight through the cell membrane once they get in, they bind to receptor proteins, intracellular receptor proteins. 
together the testosterone and the receptor make up what we call a gene regulatory protein and they will then move into the nucleus and they will activate or deactivate specific genes causing them to be first transcribed and later to be translated so that's one way another process that can happen is called methylation methylation is when methyl groups ch3s are attached to the cytosines uh, of the DNA in certain genes. This causes the DNA to essentially wind up into a tight ball called heterochromatin. And when it's in this, this tight ball, it can't be transcribed. Typically, this is permanent. So once a gene in a particular cell is methylated, essentially that gene will never work in that cell again. This can happen in multiple ways. It's very important in stem cells. Um, genes that aren't needed for the, set, the type of cell that stem cell is going to become are methylated. And this changes the cells from totipotent eventually down to unipotent. So that the only genes that aren't methylated are the ones that are needed for a skin cell to be a skin cell or a muscle cell to be a muscle cell. This also happens in uh, women with the X chromosome. As humans, remember, we only really need one active X chromosome. But ladies have two. So what happens to one of those X chromosomes is that it is highly methylated and that causes it to, to tighten up into a very tight ball, which can be seen with a microscope. It's called a, a bar body. And each of the, the cells in a female, you can locate this bar body. It's an inactivated chromosome, a chromosome that was inactivated by the methylation of that X chromosome. There's also histone acetylation. Remember, methylation causes a gene to become inactive and it's permanent. It helps cells to differentiate. Histone acetylation, on the other hand, is when a, is when a two carbon acetyl group is bonded to a histone protein. This causes the, the DNA that's wrapped around that histone to loosen up, to unwind. And this allows it to become its active form of DNA called euchromatin. And this allows transcription of that gene to happen. So this is turning the gene on. It's allowing it to be transcribed, whereas methylation is essentially turning the gene off. The nice thing about histone acetylation is it's reversible. That acetyl group can be removed and the gene goes back to its wound up inactive form. So this allows for selective transcription of a gene. It allows for an organism or a cell to respond to its environment. So these are ways that re the genes are regulated based on the transcriptional level. Gene regulation can also happen at the processing level. Remember that we start with a primary transcript. And that primary transcript needs to be processed. Let's go back to our processing picture for a second. So remember the introns have to be removed and the exons have to be spliced together. Also remember though, based on the situation, What's an intron in one case is an, maybe an exon in another case. So because the, the mRNA, the primary transcript, can be processed in multiple alternative ways, that one primary transcript can code for multiple different proteins based on the situation. Now, this is really important. Um, specifically, it's important for things like antibodies. We only have a, a few genes that code for antibodies. Antibodies protect us against disease. But because those genes can be alternatively spl spliced or processed, those few genes code for hundreds or thousands of different antibodies. The same goes for the, the protein smell receptors. We only have a handful of genes that code for protein smell receptors. But we can smell hundreds, maybe thousands of different things. And that's because those genes for those receptors can be spliced and processed in different ways and give us multiple different proteins from just a handful of, of actual genes. Remember that this only happens in eukaryotes. We also can have regulation at the, process, at the translational level. There are proteins or tiny, tiny pieces of RNA called microRNAs that can attach to an mRNA and essentially inhibit its translation. This is important in cells like the ova, the egg cell. So the egg 
will transcribe the genes that, that a growing egg needs to have ready to grow. But to conserve resources, those RNAs are blocked and they're sitting there dormant in the cell because most egg cells are never fertilized and they die. If an egg cell is fertilized, if the sperm comes in and fertilizes it, those micro RNAs are very quickly removed. All the mRNAs already made. So this allows uh, the, the egg to make those proteins that it needs very fast. But it also helps to conserve resources uh, for egg cells that are never fertilized. One other thing that we want to mention here is epigenetics. This is a very new field of genetics. The definition is here. Epigenetics is essentially the inheritance of traits transmitted by mechanisms not directly involving the nucleotide sequence. The word epigenetics literally means like on top of genetics. So what we found is that the patterns of methylation and acetylation in your parents' DNA can actually be passed on to you. So what your parents do, their, their environment and their lifestyle can cause certain genes to be activated or inactivated. Those patterns of methylation can be passed on to you. This is also why identical twins are born identical. But as they age, they become more and more different. And that's because their lifestyles cause their DNA to be methylated or acetylated in different patterns. So that even though their genes are the same, the genes that are active or inactive are different. So this is where nature, the DNA, meets nurture the environment. And it's how the two interact and how that certain genes are permanently activated or permanently deactivated. And these processes we found of methylation and acetylation, these tags can actually be passed from parent to child. All right, so here's a free response question from a few years back on the AP exam. The flow of genetic information from DNA to protein in eukaryotic cells is called the central dogma of biology. Explain the role of each of the following in protein synthesis in eukaryotic cells. So hopefully you guys know that RNA polymerase is the enzyme that actually makes the mRNA. It's the enzyme that will, will go to the template DNA sequence, insert nucleotides, building an mRNA strand. Spliceosomes or SNRPs are the enzymes in eukaryotes that will process the primary mRNA transcript. They'll remove the introns, splice together the exons, giving us a mature mRNA that can be translated. Codons are found on mRNA, and they are sequences of three nucleotides. Each codon codes for one amino acid, and it says put this amino acid in this location. Ribosomes are the uh, organelle-like structures which use the messenger mRNA to actually build the polypeptide sequences, which ultimately become proteins. And tRNA, or transfer RNA, these are the RNAs that actually deliver the amino acids to the ribosomes and ensure that the right amino acid is placed in the right sequence in the growing protein. Part B says, cells regulate both protein synthesis and protein activity. Discuss two specific mechanisms of protein regulation in eukaryotic cells. So here we could talk about different ways maybe that protein synthesis is regulated. We could talk about uh, methylation and how that methyl groups are attached to uh, the DNA, causing it to tighten up into a tight ball, which blocks its transcription and therefore ultimately the synthesis of that particular protein in that particular cell. We could talk about acetylation, how that acetylation, um, acetyl groups are added to histones, causing the DNA in that gene to unwind and making it available for transcription, and ultimately the protein is synthesized. We could talk about gene regulatory proteins, how that steroid hormones like testosterone and estrogen go straight through the cell membrane, bind to intracellular receptors, and ultimately act in the nucleus to turn on or off certain genes. Finally, part C, the central dogma does not apply to some viruses. Select a specific virus or type of virus 
and explain how it deviates from the central dogma. So what they're looking for here is a discussion of retroviruses. Viruses like uh, HIV, influenza, Ebola. These viruses don't have any DNA. They have RNA. Well, if you don't have DNA, it's kind of hard to follow the central dogma. But what these viruses do is they insert their RNA into a host along with an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. And this enzyme does the reverse of transcription. Instead of turning DNA, using DNA to make RNA, it uses their viral RNA as a template for making DNA. This DNA that can then be used in the host to do transcription into messenger RNA and ultimately translation into a protein. So part C wanted you to talk about retroviruses or give a specific example like the flu, HIV, um, or, or Ebola. And then they wanted you to talk about, well, the virus only has RNA, so it has to do reverse transcription use that to make DNA, and then from there on out, it follows the central dogma like all other organisms. All right, one other topic I want to mention is metabolic pathways. Most of the things that happen in your body are complicated, and there are chemical processes that happen in a series of steps. Each of those steps is catalyzed by a different enzyme. The product of one step then acts as the, the reactant for the next step. And the product of that step acts as the reactant for the next step until ultimately these chemical reactions happen until you make the product that you need. So these are complex tasks that occur in your body. Some examples of metabolic pathways in living things are things like photosynthesis, cell respiration, digestion. And then we could be really specific and talk about subparts of some of these processes like Krebs cycle is a metabolic pathway that's a part of cell respiration. The Calvin cycle is a metabolic pathway that's a part of photosynthesis. Glycolysis is a metabolic pathway that's a part of cell respiration. Many of these metabolic pathways are conserved across all, or at least most species. So like for example, um, fungi do aerobic cell respiration in almost the same way that we do. They have the same chemical processes almost identical enzymes, and that, that implies that we shared a common ancestor with those fungi somewhere down the road. Many of the metabolic pathways are also regulated by a process called feedback inhibition or allosteric inhibition. And we're gonna talk about feedback inhibition on the next slide, but essentially it's a control mechanism in which an enzyme, usually one of the, the very early ones in a metabolic pathway, is inhibited when the, the final product of the metabolic pathway starts to accumulate past a certain level. When that early enzyme is inhibited, that cuts off the whole metabolic pathway. And it will stay off until some of that final product is used up. And at that point, it will start back up. So let's look at a picture of how this works. So here's a metabolic pathway. So we're starting with the first reactant there's an enzyme that helps to convert that first reactant into substance B. There's a second enzyme that helps to convert substance B into substance C. A third catalyzes the conversion of C to D and so on until the final product that we need to make F is made. Well, that starts to build up in the cell in product F does the concentration of that end product builds up. We don't want to keep making more and more F forever. When we get enough, we need to stop. So what ends up happening when the concentration of F reaches a certain critical level, some of it is likely to bind with a site on one of the early enzymes, usually the first enzyme in the metabolic pathway. That site's called the feedback site or the allosteric site. When that end product binds to that site, it changes the shape of the active site. And that causes enzyme one to be temporarily turned off. Well, when enzyme one is off, that means substance B isn't being made anymore. When B is not made, there's nothing for enzyme two to work on. So the whole pathway gets turned off like a chain of dominoes. Enzyme one is going to stay inactive until the concentration of, of end product F falls past some critical level. And at that point, 
the end product F that's bound to enzyme one will, will come off. It'll be used up. Enzyme one will go back to its normal shape and the whole metabolic pathway will turn back on. This is called feedback inhibition. It's called allosteric inhibition. It's an example of negative feedback helping to regulate a metabolic pathway. It's a way to conserve your resources. And that's it.